They were young. They were scared. They were brave. They had a job to do. It was a time for eagles. They believed in their country. They believed in what they were doing and and were often ready to go and you could take them any place under the sun and they'd follow you. I thought to protect my country, I didn't think about the possibility of dying. In World War II, the hunters, the fighter pilots, were fiercely proud of their squadrons, their leaders, and their skills. Then came a fresh formation of Mustangs, some of Colonel Blakesley's bachelors. They came down from almost invisible heights to engage the enemy. They tested themselves against the enemy and against each other in what they called friendly rivalries. Walker Bud Mahurin is a top ace with the 56th Fighter Group. We were one of three fighter groups that got the P-47s, and of course, uh, you, you like to look at, uh, at scoring on the scoreboard, like we do today in all our games, and of course the first time you got a victory, that added uh, prestige to your group and prestige to your squadron. Walter Beckham, 353rd Fighter Group, U.S. Army Air Force. Bud Mahirin was accredited with 15 airplanes, and I was 14, so that's, and, and he and I were good friends. So I flew a mission one day, and I came back with two airplanes destroyed and some good film. Public relations officers, oh, they were great. We, the 353rd group, now have the highest score, and the 56th group with Bud Mahirin is now behind. I have 16, he has 15. So the Give it a group commander and I shook hands and they took pictures and big, big deal. As time went by, the more you got, the more prestige and the more envy other fighter groups uh, would have of your organization. So it became a, a competitive thing. And then, alas, Bud Mahoon came back and he had shot down one airplane. So <laughs> that was terrible. So now it's 1616, of course. The 56 will lead the show in. We escort the lead box of bombers. We've got to give them head gun cover. Nothing must break through. The fourth fighter group covers the tail of our task force. And there should be over a hundred of us. A legendary rivalry pits Hub Zemke's 56th fighter group, known as the Wolf Pack, against Don Blakesley's fourth fighter group. The Germans call them the Debden Gangsters. Don Gentili and his wingman Johnny Godfrey are top guns of the fourth. Between them, they score 36 combat kills, six over Berlin in one 20-minute dogfight. Rivals from the 56th are Bob Johnson and Francis Gabreski, who themselves are in a nip and tuck competition for the title of America's number one ace over Europe. Gabreski will score 28 kills and gets the title. Later, a disputed kill is awarded to Johnson for a tie. In the final tally, the 56th destroys 1,006 Luftwaffe planes. The 4th gets 1,006 and a half kills. We salute the Skymasters engaged in the greatest air battles the world has ever known.
Rivalries for the title of Top Gun helped the aces forget, if only for a moment, that the threat of death was constant. Mackie Steinhoff, Luftwaffe. Dann geht man natürlich... And you go to bed at night with the thought, will you be alive the next morning? Well, if the weather was good, then you knew that the bombers would come, that you would have to start the plane, that you would have an air battle, and then you wouldn't know whether you would be alive or not. How we cope with this, I couldn't tell you today. In the battle for the skies, discipline is tight, tough, and crucial. Trust and teamwork are essential to survival. But there is no taming some of the hunters. They are the mavericks, the loners. A few gain blazing fame and the admiration of their fellows. Too often, the price for breaking the rules is death. Altman Hans Joachim Marseille, Luftwaffe. He wears his hair long, he likes jazz music, and he loves the ladies. Marseille was an extremely good-looking young man. We're talking about people who were 20 to 22 years old at the time. But he lacked the discipline necessary. During his rest periods, he had far too many women. Basically, I had nothing against this, but it did have an effect on his performance. And I told him once, Marseille, I really can't work with such undisciplined aces. He was transferred then to North Africa. In Africa, he became the star of Africa. He was talented, and the secret of his success was the fact that there were no girls in Africa. Marseille scores 158 kills. Returning from a mission, the engine flames. He bails out, his chute fails to open, and he is crushed against the hard desert floor. A makeshift memorial marks his grave. Greg Pappy Boyington leads the Maverick Black Sheep Squadron of Marine Pilots in the Pacific. Oh, Pappy Boyington was pretty colorful on the ground because he was a rough, tough character. When Pappy uh, had quite a few drinks, he was a good man to stay away from. And I knew him very well because I was billeted with him in the last days of Rangoon. And most of the stories about him are true. Like the night he shot up the town clock in Rangoon, and we had to take his... Uh, we all carried a sidearm. We had to take it away from him. And uh, But uh, yes, there were many colorful characters, I promise you. <laughs> Boyington is shot down, presumed dead, and awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. Amazingly, he is rescued by a Japanese submarine and spends the rest of the war in a prison camp. He returns to claim the title of top marine ace with 28 kills. While the Mavericks make news, it is the team players who win most of the victories. In the Pacific, Hiroyoshi Nishizawa is Japan's top ace. He is killed as a passenger on a transport plane evacuating pilots back to Japan. Edward Butch O'Hare is the first U.S. Navy ace. In the Battle of the Coral Sea, O'Hare downs five Japanese bombers in five minutes and is awarded the Medal of Honor. O'Hare will die in a night battle, the victim of friendly fire. And he was returning to join up on his mother torpedo plane. And the rear gunner in that torpedo plane thought he was an enemy airplane. And he turned his turret on him unknowingly and uh, shot Butch down. Over Russia, Alexander Pokrishkin flies American P-39 fighters and scores an official 59 kills. Because he has become a symbol of heroism to the nation, his life is too valuable to risk in combat. Grounded by the Red Air Force, he flies secretly 
and adds to his score. When he is airborne, the Germans warn their pilots, Achtung, der ist Pokrischken in der Luft. Attention, the ace Pokrischken is in the sky. In the Pacific, a rivalry for Top Gun matches Richard Bong against Tommy McGuire. Dick Bong is the first American ace to pass Eddie Rickenbacker's World War I record of 26 kills, on his way to a total of 40. McGuire gets 38 victories. McGuire dies in combat. Bong is awarded the Medal of Honor, days before the war ends, while testing America's first jet fighter, Dick Bong is killed. Douglas Bader, Royal Air Force, is a special kind of hero to the British people. Bader, wearing artificial legs, exemplifies the grit and courage that won the Battle of Britain. Once he was in the cockpit of the Spitfire, I think he was the equal of uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that he was disabled. You didn't notice it. Bader is shot down and captured by the Germans. Luftwaffe ace Adolf Galland arranges for him to get a new pair of aluminum legs to replace the ones Bader lost in the crash. Bader gets the metal legs and tries to escape. But of course he was a great, inspiring uh, leader uh, who was utterly fearless and uh, basically taught us how to conduct ourselves uh, as young uh, fighter pilots. He taught us how to lead and what it was all about. The wild ones, the quiet ones, the flamboyant ones, the serious ones. All of them took the hunter's challenge and all earned immortality in the proud fraternity of eagles. The fighter pilots who did battle in hostile skies were for the most part young men in their early 20s. Each flag painted on the side of a plane represented a victory for one and death for an adversary. Matters of life and death were very much on these young minds. There is an encounter between the two of us. We came together in battle. We intend to destroy each other. You don't hear the machine gun. You don't see any blood. Shooting in a plane is a relatively clean affair. So you really don't think about the person who sits in the aircraft. Another reason why people like myself, who find it difficult to squash flies, joined the Air Force was because you're not killing people. You're killing aircraft. And it used to come this huge shock if you were firing at an airplane and suddenly a body came out in the parachute. And suddenly brought home the fact that there were people there. Saburo Sakai, a top ace of the Japanese Air Force. To shoot down the enemy during a battle means not only shooting down a plane, but a pilot in the plane would die, too. Shoot down means to kill another person. So all the battles were very important for me. I remember all the battles. I should because I killed people. If I forgot any of them, I will become inhuman. For many pilots, the deadly hunt became a sport, somehow separated from any cause or flag. It was a way to cope with levels of stress beyond the pull of any G-force. Andrew McKenzie, Royal Air Force. We used to look at those crosses on the aircraft and and try to hit the cross, but it was almost like a pinball machine. We never thought about his next of kin or whether he had kids or not or anything like that. I think if you had of, you probably would have, yeah, it would have taken the fire out of the, the whole thing, you know? Medal of Honor winner, Marine pilot Joe Foss. Anyone that gets silly ideas about uh, uh, you know, when you're in a battle with those birds about worrying about their welfare, it's off the end of the plank and into the deep. The game was for very high stakes. 
Another sunrise, another day, week, month, survival. Death found a rich harvest in the skies. Uh, there's no one that in the short span of life we have here that likes to leave ahead of schedule. And of course, war will cause you to leave ahead of schedule, I'll guarantee you. I've seen it firsthand. Arseniy Vorozhikin, Red Air Force. I was like a child, like a child who doesn't know what fear is and rushes into battle. And only then when he feels pain, a child then feels fear. Fear is a great thing. It's a great instinct for self-preservation. It's absolutely necessary. People who don't experience fear are not normal. Facing inner fear, seeing friends die, it was all part of the job. I think it hits you worse, though, when the guy who was shot down or disappeared was one of your closer friends. When that guy was your close friend, I think it was the worst. He felt it the deepest. The pilots faced burnout and fatigue. Uh, after sort of a long mission in some combat and returning home, I would say to myself, I hope I don't see any more Germans today. I'm, I don't feel like it. They shared a closeness that gave them strength. I think that there always was a certain sort of feeling of camaraderie between Ammon, you know. And they were, after all, just young men doing their duty in the same way as we were. They knew the elation of flight and the hunt. I loved flight. I loved the sport of the third dimension. It was always like a drug to me. I flew passionately. Wing Commander Jeffrey Page, Royal Air Force. I had a very smart uniform with a pair of wings on it. I had a lovely fast airplane. We were considered rather sort of glamorous characters, I suppose, in a way. We didn't have any time to chase the girls, sadly. We were in the air all day and too tired at night to uh, uh, deflect our interests. And they knew a special kind of pride. When the day is over and you get back and you have a, a glass of beer or something, it tastes just that much better because you stuck your neck out. change skies change some memories grow dimmer with the years but some will blaze brightly for all time the fascination of flight can't be expressed in words once you've experienced it you will never be able to forget it you know when you go up there there's a very cruel and real world that you're in and you may not come back from that mission then for a moment you feel a feeling of hate but it is more important to be successful and when you think that you're probably a lot better than anybody else you better be better than anybody else we were all the same i think that all pilots have the same feeling but the war created devils they had a job to do, which was shoot us down, and we had a job to shoot them down, and that's, that's the way it goes. You see these um, tracer bullets coming at you, and you know that every one of them is lethal, and it's pointed at you. 
And the most important thing is not to be a coward. The hunters are the ones that go out and kill, and the others will be, be hunted. Our pilots, one by one, I felt, oh, they have died too young. You're up there to win. You play to win. And you just got to love what you're doing. That's what makes a good fighter pilot. Looking back on a terrible war, for all the terror and the horror, still the wind will whisper, yes, there was glory. Glory.